Now, the real wage is constrained, and it actually even falls just a little bit. So for the first time in US history, again, because of the changes that we talked about, the real wage is not rising. It's actually, at best, constant, and it actually falls a little bit for the American worker. So we have a wage depression for almost, you know, almost 40 years in the United States. Not to mention, not, no one really talks about it. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, fact that this decline in the real wage of workers compared to the rising real wage prior to the 1980s, prior to President Reagan, is a remarkable change in the United States, which draws very not too much analysis. At the same time, this continues to fall in part because of these cheap Chinese wage goods, but also the, the continual rise in the productivity of labor. Hence, the S over V kind of takes off in the United States this time around because of the decline in the real wage added to this decline in the unit value of wage goods. So this is a dramatic increase in the rate of exploitation in the United States, which in a sense you can see from the rising gap between the black and the red lines. Okay? What this says is this is this rising S over V. Okay? Now, because of the historical importance of rising consumption to the workers, because that be part, becomes part of the American uh, dream and the American exceptionalism, the workers for over this period do not cut their consumption. What happens is two dramatic things. You would say, well, they've got to cut their consumption. No. What happens is that consumption more or less continues like this. Consumption continues to rise. This is consumption. Okay. Despite the fact that the real wages they receive doesn't warrant this. And the reason why consumption rises for, for workers are two. Number one, everybody in the family goes to work. So mommy, daddy, grandpa, grandma, and so forth, everybody in the, farm, in the family starts to sell their labor power. And what becomes more and more important in the United States is the family wage. Even though the individual wage of mommy and daddy are falling, as mommy gets into the labor force, she's too receiving a, a, a lower uh, real wage because of what I mentioned to you before, changes in the labor market. Okay. The family wage rises because everybody's working and that helps to maintain this consumption standard which is so important to the American families, number one. Number two, debt. The second one is that everybody seems to go into debt to help finance the higher consumption. Okay. So as you can see from this, the, that everybody working and going into debt helps to maintain this so that the blue line is above the red line. The red line, again, is the, the, the real wages. So the real wages are constrained, if not falling. Productivity continues to rise. And the consumption of the workers are financed um, increasingly by debt, and of course, as I said, everybody working. Okay, so that's one way to capture what has gone on. And you know, the consequences of this, I'm going to come back and I'm going to end with the consequences, but one of which, of course, is, is, is the debt per capita takes off in the United States, and that's going to pr produce a disaster um, after 2008. The United States economy becomes increasingly fr fragile, sensitive to this rising debt, and sensitive to everybody in the family working, as we shall see. Okay. Just staying with this for a moment, there's another interesting thing to say about this fan which is opening here, which is, okay, let's see. If the surplus is just exploding in the United States, because now the value of labor power is falling because of the fall in the unit value and the fall of the real wage, that means that capitalists have more to distribute. Don't forget our equation. Okay, so this is the, you know, the workers take their labor power, they go out and buy uh, uh, consumer goods. 
The surplus value received by the capitalist, which is exploding, enables the capitalist to make all kinds of distributions. To whom? Well, to all occupants of subsumed class positions. Who, are, who might they be? Well, those are people who get cuts of the surplus. That's their subsumed class revenue. Who are these people? These are the managers, the owners, um, the landlords, the merchants, uh, bankers, did I say bankers? These people are getting increased, are increasingly getting more higher cuts of this exploding surplus to supply their conditions of existence. So if I take the ratio of this to the workers' value of labor power plus their former subsumed class revenues that they got from their unionized position, if I take just this ratio and talk about it in terms of this period after the 1980s, what do we have? Well, look, we have this one going to zero. That's the attack, that's the attack on unions, the reduction in the price of labor power, and so forth. We have now a diminished V. So the denominator in this fraction is falling. At the same time, the numerator is rising. Why? Because the reduction in the value of labor power and now allows more surplus, relative surplus value, allows more surplus, which can then be distributed to whom? to the top managers of the corporation, to the owners of the stock, to the bankers, to the, to, you know, to the owners of Walmart, and so forth. And so you have a rising ratio of the incomes in the numerator to the occupants of subsumed class positions and a falling income to the workers. And all of a sudden, Americans begin to recognize a radically changed income distribution. So this is reflected in the changed income distribution that everyone wants to talk about, or a lot of people want to talk about in the United States. The US income distribution tends to become more and more unequal. More and more of the total income is going to people in the numerator. A smaller portion of the American income is going to people in the denominator. So the income distribution in the states becomes more uneven over time, during this period of time, and it begins to resemble what it was uh, prior to the 1920s. You know, it, it, it's about as unequal now as it may have been in 1917 or, or whatever. And this has dramatic consequences in the United States. For example, this uneven distribution of income as a result of what we have described is also reflected in a bifurcation of consumption in the United States. What that means is that the consumption of the workers in, in the uh, denominator becomes constrained other than debt and everybody in the family working, okay? So people in the, um, in the denominator are struggling to maintain their consumption, buying their Chevrolet, going to buy their shirts at Walmart and so forth, whilst at the same time people in the numerator are expanding their consumption, it, it, you know, it, it, it perhaps at levels not seen since the, the 1880s and, and, and 1890s. So you have what you have in the numerator are people who are buying these monster homes in the United States with three or four of these expensive cars and, and, and so forth. Okay, so you have this bifurcation, as I said, of consumption in the United States. The consumption of the workers gets constrained, whereas the consumption of the uh, richer elements in society kind of takes off, reflecting the change, the distribution of income, reflecting in turn this remarkable change in the rate of exploitation in the United States. So what, what we're trying to do again is to connect this changed income distribution, changed consumption pattern in the United States to the changed class structure. Final two points and we're gonna end on this, okay? There are two other major consequences of uh, what has occurred during this period of time, and I'd like to bring them to your attention, although we're not going to uh, analyze them in any detail, but they're interesting. Um, they're affecting everybody's lives in the United States. They're very current, and so hence, I want to end 305 on that note. There's a crisis in the state, okay? If I just take to the state for a moment, the, this is, I'm just talking about not the federal government, And if we look at their revenues and their expenditures, we have the subsumed class revenues, which are from corporate taxes. Then we have the state collecting non-class revenues on everybody else. So this is the corporate tax. 
This is the personal tax. So the corporate tax would be the tax on surplus value. Okay, so the, the, once again, to review what we've done, the capitalists have to take a cut of their surplus and they have to uh, pay a tax to the state and the state in turn supplies the capitalists, um, the exploiting capitalists with key conditions of existence, money supply, defense, private property, and so forth. But then the state also taxes everybody else. That's not a subsumed class revenue because everybody else are not appropriators of surplus and hence they don't have any surplus to distribute to the state. So these would be, for example, mostly the wage workers, but all kinds of, remember now, unproductive labor as well. It's not just that the productive labor gets taxed, but unproductive labor gets taxed. By definition, the productive and unproductive laborers are not appropriators of surplus. Okay, that was a couple of lectures that we presented. So only the productive capitalists are producing the, the productive capitalists have the surplus produced by these productive laborers. The expenditures on the right-hand side, so this is the revenues from the state. The expenditures on the right-hand side would be all the expenditures that the state makes to help support the private capitalists, plus the expenditures that the state makes to help support all these non-class revenues, that the personal taxes that people pay. Okay. Defense expenditures, swimming pools, and education for the public. Welfare, welfare for the workers, welfare for the industrial capitalists, the farm subsidy, for example, and all kinds of other subsidies given to capitalists. What happens starting in the 1980s again, to go back where we started, the corporate taxes get cut dramatically. Personal taxes get cut dramatically. So starting with President Reagan, there's a tax reduction which occurs, which is supposed to stimulate capitalism in the way that we described, and it, 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 it does. There's no question that it does that. So it, it, you get a cut in the left-hand side, revenues fall. At the same time, expenditures rise. That is, defense expenditures rise, and you have then a inequality emerging, that is deficits emerging, because you're reducing the left-hand side, at the same time you're, you're increasing this, and then people begin to, and no one's going to cut the defense budget. Clinton does cut, President Clinton does cut it a bit, but it quickly resumes its normal rise over time. And those are, once again, those are tanks and airplanes and so forth that the capitalists produce and sell to the federal government. And so a struggle emerges over these Y goods. And you know, to, sum, to just uh, uh, make this much more simple than what it is, the Republicans argue you've got to cut this. The Democrats argue you can't cut. You've got to maintain this, if not increase. So you have emerging a struggle in Congress right up into the present, which is the two parties argue about this and they ignore the rest because they, they both accept this cut in taxes to finance a rising expenditures. And so you, know, you have deficits. It's not surprising. Deficits emerge from this kind of configuration of revenues and, and, and expenditures. And the deficits that emerge, what, that, what does that mean? The federal government increasingly issues bonds to finance this deficit. So the state gets out of control. There is a crisis in the state which emerges, which continues in a variety of different ways right up to the present. The crisis is, gets to be uh, not as severe um, under President Clinton because he, Bush won and then President Clinton, they begin to raise taxes and they begin to cut this defense expenditures. But that's the first time this occurs over this 40 year period. And hence that surplus that the government uh, started to rise, which helped to reduce the deficit, that's eliminated by Bush II's uh, tax cuts, and then the increase, continued increase in expenditures. So these deficits, as I said, continue. The state is out of control. So that's, I don't want to lose the big picture now. 